I'm John Ehrlichman. And tensions between China and North America are back in focus today, whether it's news about a broadening iPhone ban within China, or whether it's the tensions in Ottawa right now on the issue of foreign meddling in our political process. Of course, this tension between China and the West has been building for years, and many would argue it will reshape the story around business, trade, and economic growth in the decade ahead. One of the most closely tracked thought leaders on this topic is Peter Zahn, a global geopolitical strategist whose books, including The End of the World is Just Beginning, explore themes like the collapse of globalization. And they're helping to paint a potential roadmap for the ge geopolitical landscape ahead. Peter joins us live now from the Mavericks Private Equity Leadership Summit taking place in Toronto. Peter, thanks very much for your time. Appreciate you uh, joining us. Pleasure we, to be here. We saw, obviously, for years, as I alluded to there, a much more interconnected global economy. Uh, it does feel, however, like things are very quickly changing, and it's a, it's a theme that you have really leaned into. What's your assessment of what's going on right now? Well, we're dealing with decades of geopolitical shifts all coming true at once. Uh, I would say the biggest problem that we're facing right now, which is something that is not political at all, is that when we all started to modernize and globalize and industrialize back in the 50s and 60s, we started moving from the farms back into the cities. When you move into the cities, kids are no longer free labor, you have fewer of them, and you play that forward 75 years, and now countries as diverse as Italy and Germany and Poland and Korea and China and Japan have aged out. And this was always the decade that they weren't gonna run out of children. That happened 30 years ago. This is the decade they run out of working aged adults. So we really have this use by date of about 2030 for most of the advanced countries in the world with North America kind of being an exception because we have a very different economic system and geography. So this was always gonna end by the numbers. The question is whether tensions make it end faster. And one of the big questions that we have sitting here next to the United States is how does Canada fit in to not just the demographics that you're talking about, but a situation where every day we seem to be hearing more and more headlines about tensions between the U.S. and China. What's your view on, on Canada's economic road ahead? So Canada has some pros and cons going for it. Let's start with the pros. Uh, number one, you've got the industrial infrastructure that is a legacy from previous integration. Anyone who wants to compete with Canada for access to the American space has to overcome that. That's a multi-trillion dollar question that you just can't wave a wand. Second, Canada has found a partial patch to the demographic crisis that has plagued most of the rest of the world in immigration. It's the only country in the world that's been able to pull it off. You've got the highest percentage foreign born in your country. You're almost triple that of the country in the second place. Uh, that comes with its own risks uh, in terms of social stability. That comes with its own pressures in terms of housing. But as long as you keep the door open, you're bringing in people in their 20s. And there just is a very limited supply of those on a global basis that actually have skills. And Canada is the only country that has been able to pull this off. Uh, the biggest con, I would say, is that your structure is now so different from everyone else that there's really no one to look to for an example or learn from. You, you are the vanguard. And you, you mentioned the word supply. Let's talk about supply chains. For the last couple of years, as people have been coming out of the COVID pandemic, watching inflation surge, trying to make sense of headlines that say, well, there's a lot happening around the world that factors into inflation. And then central banks themselves keep raising interest rates and telling us there are things that have changed within the supply chain that could make the inflation story different. Does the geopolitical relationship play a role, in your opinion, in, in, in this inflation story that everybody's trying to figure out? It certainly does, but let me give you the hard stop first. The demographic situation in China is so atrocious. 40 years on from the one-child policy, they've run out of children, they've run out of 20-somethings, they're now running out of 30-somethings. That by 2030, the Chinese system will not be able to function as a significant economic player within China, much less as a global exporter. They're already aging out, they've already been priced out, labor costs are up by a factor of 14 since 2000. They're on the downward slide, which means in North America, if we still want stuff, we are going to have to build it our damn selves. We've got that capacity. We can expand our industrial plant and industrial construction spending, and the United States is already through the roof, setting records above World War II levels. 
but we need to be cognizant of geopolitical tensions because that can bring everything forward. What we're seeing in American tensions with the Chinese, specifically in tech, probably should have happened 15 years ago in order to ease this transition we're about to go to, but now we're dealing with the tail end of COVID disruptions. We're just now hitting the demographic and China disruptions and geopolitical tensions can bring this all together and make us suffer a lot more than we would maybe need to unless we can come up with a plan. So that's not the American forte. And so you explain the, the, the Canadian situation right now um, and Clearly, the world will watch how things happen with our economic road ahead. Uh, there are obvious constant conversations around the U.S. and China, and, and certainly we've continued to watch the situation uh, in Ukraine and uh, the, the road ahead, let's say, for Russia. Are there other markets around the world, though, that you think are worthy of having a conversation? If we're talking about new geopolitical dynamics and changes over the next decade, what aren't we talking about in the popular media that's worth talking about these days? Well, let, let me give you two, and honestly, this is some pretty good news because a lot of the heavy lifting has already been done. The first one is Mexico. Uh, courtesy of Donald Trump, of all places, Mexico, Canada, the United States are linked together in the SEFTA, second NAFTA accord. And so the two of our countries are now linked together at the hip to the advanced developing country that has the healthiest demography and the most upward motion. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, second, Southeast Asia. Courtesy of a number of binding agreements, Canada and the United States already have access to several of these markets. And these are the parts that are likely to pick up a lot of the pieces that the Chinese drop. If you're looking for mid to high level tech, Vietnam is the obvious, I'm sorry, uh, Thailand is the obvious choice. If you're looking for an up and coming assembly that's turning into a tech player, Vietnam looks very good. And if you just need sheer mass, it's hard to beat Indonesia. We've already not just taken the first, second, or third steps, we already have deals with some of these countries. There's clearly more that can be done, and we really need to do about a $5 trillion industrial infrastructure expansion, expansion across the region, but it's not like we're starting from scratch. Before I let you go, Peter, obviously, as I mentioned, the the way you're watching the world unfold um, is uh, getting a lot of attention. And especially in this year where, you know, we look in technology at changes like AI and you see corporate boardrooms that are focused on how that's going to change their business. Do you anticipate that more companies are going to have to look at the changing geopolitical dynamics and make that a part of how they do business or think about doing business going forward? Absolutely. I'm never going to tell people to ignore tech. That's part of the, the, the background now. Uh, but so many of our manufacturing supply chains are wrapped up in countries that, from an economic point of view, aren't going to be able to function in just a few years. We have to rebuild all of that if we still want access to it. And the sooner we start in this environment of higher capital costs and higher labor costs, the better. The, the first movers have already moved. We already have record unemployment levels in most of North America. There isn't this huge pool of labor to draw from, which means we have to start choosing what it is to focus on. And that also means choosing what not to and what we just won't have in the future.